News Radio, I'm Jim Anderson. Friday's March for Life and other demonstrations across the country with hundreds of thousands of supporters over the weekend keyed in on ending abortion. California bishops helped lead demonstrations in L.A. and the California Bay areas. Leaders say abortion is not only upheld by a 70% incidence of coercion, but also relies on denying the humanity and personhood of the unborn. Heading into the D.C. March for Life, House and Senate legislation is keying in on broad public support for pregnancy support centers. The Pregnancy Center Support Act offers a huge 50% tax credit for pregnancy center donations. Another bill allows states to contract with pregnancy support groups to help needy families. This is Life News Radio. Isn't life an awesome gift? Married couples have the power to co-create an eternal life with God that will last forever. God has also designed us so that we can plan, can order our families effectively, naturally, and without the artificial means of chemicals or barriers. Register for classes in NFP, Natural Family Planning, near you, online at ccli.org or call 800 745 8252. The morning of the March for Life, Bishop Joseph Strickland joined Priests for Life and Catholic Online in announcing a new online pro-life university. Classes will cover every aspect of the pro-life movement, science, medicine, law, religion, public relations, politics, even abortion healing. And after thanking the March for Life on Friday for the ongoing fight against abortion, on Sunday, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis dropped out of the race for president. DeSantis endorsed Donald Trump for president. For pro-life headlines, delivered to your email address daily. Sign up at lifenews.com. This has been Life News Radio. The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network presents Saints and Seasons. On January 23rd, we celebrate the feast of St. Marianne Cope, Virgin. Barbara Kube, or Cope, was born in Germany in the year of our Lord, 1838. The next year, her family emigrated to the United States, settling near Utica in central New York. In 1862, Barbara entered the Third Order Franciscans in Syracuse, taking the name Sister Marianne. Fifteen years later, she became Mother Superior, having spent several previous years running the first public hospital in Syracuse, St. Joseph's. In 1883, the order received a letter from Hawaii, begging for help with caring for the lepers there. Mother Marianne and several of her nuns were the only American religious to answer this plea, and they swiftly improved the terrible conditions of the lepers on Oahu. A few years later, at the request of the ailing Father Damien, the sisters established themselves on the island of Molokai, taking over St. Damien's initiatives there. The famed author Robert Louis Stevenson, though not a Catholic, was a prominent supporter of their work. Mother Marianne tended to the lepers in Hawaii for over 30 years, until her death in 1918. True to a prediction she made, none of the sisters ever contracted the disease. Also celebrated on this day are the espousals of Joseph and Mary, St. Raymond of Penafort, St. Emerentiana, foster sister of St. Agnes, St. Parmenas, one of the first seven deacons, and many other martyrs, confessors, and holy virgins. For more about the saints and seasons of the Catholic Church, visit thestationofthecross.com forward slash saints and seasons. Joe McLean here, host of A Catholic Take, heard on the Station of the Cross each weekday morning at 7 a.m. Eastern. A bold synthesis of information and inspiration, keeping you up to date on the news and issues that you may have missed from a courageous Catholic perspective. That's A Catholic Take, weekday morning, 7 a.m., right here on the Station of the Cross and the free iCatholic Radio mobile app. Download it today. God love you. I'm Jim Havens, host of The Simple Truth, heard weekdays at 4 p.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. God so loved the world that he didn't create this committee to sit around in a circle and solicit people's opinions and decide which best course of action to take. No, he so loved the world that he sent his son, the truth. He's the answer. So our faith in Christ gives us the unshaken way to stay Catholic. That's The Simple Truth, weekdays at 4 p.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. This is Joe McLean, and you're listening to the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of the truth with clarity and charity. Heard around the world on your Android and Apple mobile devices. Go into the world and tell every man that you meet, there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take 
What do you need to know right now? A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bull synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Are we on the brink of a schism? Hmm. There are some saying that we are, in fact, a Western schism, a new Western schism, calling out the dirty old men. We're going to be talking about uh, potential schisms, heresies, the pontificate, and those in high office or power positions that uh, have, uh, let's just say, less than credible morality that needs to be called out. Layla Miller is going to be on the program. She's got an article out over at Crisis Magazine. Let's call out dirty old men. You remember when you could do that? You could call out the pervs and you wouldn't get in trouble for it? It doesn't seem like that's the case anymore. Layla Miller joins us at 30 past to talk about that. Dr. Anthony Stein is on the program, though, because uh, there's another article over at Crisis Magazine. Cardinal Mueller was being interviewed by Crisis, and he had some very inter interesting things to say about heretical popes, what can and cannot be done. Cardinal Mueller's been pretty bold lately. What is going on there? We'll have that conversation with Dr. Anthony Stein from Return to Tradition at 14 past the hour. Lots of stories in the news, of course, which we'll link to in the show notes over at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT, where, by the way, you can find the podcast of A Catholic Take. And let me just tell you that uh, I've heard it from good authority that uh, if you leave a five star review of A Catholic Take on Spotify or or iTunes, you may or may not get 100 years off of purgatory. Hey, don't fact check that. Just go with it. Just run with it. Go to the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Let's pray. Let's dive in. So much to get to. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection implored thy help or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your saint of the day. Saint Marianne Cope, pray for us. Barbara Koob, or Cope, was born in Germany in the year of our Lord, 1838. The next year, her family emigrated to the United States, settling near Utica in central New York. In 1862, Barbara entered the Third Order Franciscans in Syracuse, taking the name Sister Marianne and focusing at first on teaching. Fifteen years later, she became Mother Superior, having spent several previous years running the first public hospital in Syracuse, St. Joseph's. In 1883, the order received a letter from the Hawaiian royal family, begging for help with caring for the lepers on the islands. Mother Mary Ann and several of her nuns were the only American religious to answer this plea, and they swiftly improved the terrible conditions of the lepers on Oahu. A few years later, at the request of the ailing Father Damien, the sisters established themselves on the island of Molokai, with Mother Mary Ann directly taking over St. Damien's home for boys after the holy priest's death. The famed author Robert Louis Stevenson, though not a Catholic himself, was a prominent supporter of their work. Mother Mary Ann tended to the lepers in Hawaii for over 30 years until her death in 1918. True to a prediction she made, none of the sisters ever contracted the disease themselves. St. Mary Ann Cope, pray for us. And now your headline news. LifeSite News reports British Columbia electric grid at risk of shortfall as province limits natural gas. According to a report by the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, British Columbia's electric grid is at risk of shortfall in extreme weather conditions. The report warned that BC could experience power shortfalls beginning in 2026 as the new Democratic Party NDP government continues to phase out natural gas for power production. BC is at the forefront of the push to outlaw natural resources. According to their climate plan, newly constructed homes will be primarily heated with options like electrical baseboard heat, while a heat pump will be installed to kick in at negative 20 degrees Celsius. 
The province is also pushing for all new vehicles sold in 2035 to be fully electric. The Post Millennial is reporting New York moves to provide health care, free health care, to illegal immigrants. A New York Senate bill, which was referred to the Senate Financial Committee on January the 8th, seeks to make low-income illegal immigrants under the age of 65 eligible for the New York State Health Innovation Plan. The state began offering Medicaid to qualified illegal immigrants over the age of 65 on January the 1st, a change from the emergency Medicaid program that offered illegal immigrants to have access to free health care in emergency situations only. The Ground News is reporting Supreme Court allows federal agents to cut razor wire that Texas installed on the U.S.-Mexico border. The Supreme Court voted 5-4 to four to allow Border Patrol agents to cut razor wire on the U.S.-Mexico border in Texas despite an ongoing lawsuit. The wire is part of Texas Governor Greg Abbott's dispute with the administration over the immigration enforcement. However, the federal immigration law takes precedent over the Texas effort to control the flow of migrants, apparently. Texas Governor Greg Abbott says after the Supreme Court's ruling that he will defend Texas constitutional authority to secure the southern border and that Texas will prevent the Biden administration from removing property. And those those are your headline news. Apparently, you, you're not allowed to stop the federal government from not enforcing the law. Come on now. Hey, the gospel comes to us from Mark chapter 3, verses 31 through 35. The mother of Jesus and his brothers arrived at the house. Standing outside, they sent word to Jesus and called him. A crowd seated around him told him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. But he said to them in reply, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at the crowd, seated in the circle, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. A Catholic commentary on Holy Scripture said today, quoting, I think, you know, We'll get to Venerable Bede in a moment. A Catholic commentary in Holy Scripture said, These words of Christ are not a repudiation of the ties of blood, nor a refusal to acknowledge the duties which arise from such relationship. Christ condemned the cause, causistry which made it possible for undutiful children to evade the obligations imposed by the fourth commandment in Mark chapter 7. And when dying on the cross, showed his solicitude for his mother in John 19. Here, however, he wished to inculcate the doctrine that the claims of natural kinship are subordinate to the primary duty of performing God's will. And this is something I've said a billion times, and I'll say it again, my last dying breath. Our Lady is special, not because of her biological connection to our Savior. She is special because she said yes knowing full well what that meant. Let that sink in. Her fiat makes her special, not so much her biology. It goes on to say his brethren, other references to the brethren of Christ are to be found in Mark 6, Mark, uh, Matthew 12, and Matthew 13, Luke 8, John 2, John 7, John 5, John 10, Acts 1, 1 Corinthians 9, Galatians 1. The evidence of the New Testament and of the tradition leads to the conclusion that the brethren were cousins of Christ. The precise degree of relationship and also the question whether they were related to Christ through Our Lady or through St. Joseph remains uncertain. Now, Haydock's Catholic Bible commentary, like to quote Venerable Bede today, the Saint Bede, says the brethren of our Lord were not the children of the Blessed Virgin. Nor were they the sons of St. Joseph by a former wife, as some pretend. I love that. That's so good. That's just venerable bead, man. Oh, I like you. Some pretend. But in the scripture language and in this place, we understand by brethren the relatives of Mary and Joseph, the kinsfolk. Venerable Bede would go on to say, Our Lord does not refuse to go out through any the least inten- in attention to his mother. 
He wishes hereby to teach us the preference we should give to the business of our Heavenly Father before that of our earthly parents. Neither does he consider his brethren as beneath his attention, but prefers spiritual before temporal duties, and shows us that a religious union of hearts and feelings is far more lasting and better rooted than any other ties of affinity, of friendship whatsoever. Man, oh man, blood is thicker than water, don't you know? It is a difficult thing to be faithful to God and God's will for your life than it is to, uh, you know, and then to have to maybe say reject, say, family ties because they reject you over your, over your Catholic faith, over what you believe. Trust me, I know this firsthand. I know what this feels like every single day I wake up. I am reminded of this very harsh reality. We must make choices, and those choices have consequences. But we have but one choice truly to make. I choose Christ, the one Savior, the one mediator between God and man, who has given this woman a unique opportunity to be my mother too. When she said fiat, when she said yes, let it be done unto me according to thy word, she gave us the example to follow, to follow God's will more than anything else in the world, even if it meant that your only son would have to die on a cross, suffer, just as Psalm 22 seemed to indicate in Isaiah 53, both of which she had memorized. Our Lady chose God's will even above her, her own flesh. And so should you, and so should I. Choose God first today. We'll be right back. The Catholic Church, that even in the temporal order, does more truly charitable work than any other institution in the world, we see very clearly our Lord's words being fulfilled, that the fig tree will bring forth much fruit. Let us pray that it brings forth more fruit, for even though we may rejoice in the harvest, we also know that the harvest is restricted by our sins. We have to strive each and every moment of our lives by the grace of God to overcome our sins and our sinful tendencies in order that the mystical body of Christ may truly bud forth and all the fruits that the Lord wishes to distribute to the world, whether they be of the spiritual order or of the temporal order, all those fruits may be received by the souls in this world and so that all souls may find at the end of, of their lives the true meaning of those final words of our Lord, that heaven and earth will pass away and be replaced by one of two realities, the joy of eternal bliss in heaven or the pains of eternal damnation in hell. That's Sermons for Everyday Living from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. The Station of the Cross began broadcasting in Buffalo, New York in 1999. Since then, our listening areas have multiplied and expanded into several states. While our mission is to grow the Catholic faith through radio and other media outlets, our apostolate is supportive of but independent from your local diocese. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. The Station of the Cross has many ways to keep you informed about our programming. You can view the highlights of our primetime programming schedule or the full 24-7 programming grid at both thestationofthecross.com or the free iCatholic Radio app. Just search under the Programming tab. Our website also offers a printable version for your convenience. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It is great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Coming up at 30 past the hour, Layla Miller is going to join us. She's got an article over at uh, Crisis Magazine, crisismagazine.com. Let's call out dirty old men again. Remember when you could do that? Nowadays, it seems that she calls them perv splainers in the article. It's quite good, actually. We're going to link to it in the show notes for you. We're going to be talking about that with Layla Miller coming up at 30 past. Do join us if you can. Lots of stories in the news, of course, that are of great concern to, to me, and I'm sure they are to you as well. Like, here's one that I saw trending this morning. Pope Francis has today appointed the main authors of Fiducia Supacans, Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez, and Monsignor Armando Mateo, 
respectively member and consultor to the dicastery for the promotion of Christian unity. So in spite of the fact that uh, there seems to be worldwide pushback on Fernandez in particular, there's a story coming up on that in the next news segment, actually. In spite of it all, despite of it all, however you pr prefer to say that, um, they're getting more appointments, not less. And in fact, I saw an, someone posted something. Pope Francis recently said uh, in, an, in some sort of a television news or, uh, interview or something like that, that he feels very lonely and isolated over the whole blessing of irregular unions thing. Well, golly, you is, you think? Worldwide pushback. And maybe, just maybe, you might want to back that off. I'm just, just asking for a friend. But I saw this other article over at Crisis, and uh, we've reached out to Anthony Stein. Hopefully he'll join us any second now, uh, and we'll be able to get his uh, precise comments on this. But it says, the Catholic Church is not the Pope's church, and Catholics are therefore not papists, but Christians. An exclusive interview with Cardinal Gerhard Mueller. You know, when I was in Rome at the LifeSite Forum conference, where I interviewed Bishop Strickland, uh, Michael Matt, Edward Penton, and others, Cardinal Mueller was there, gave a talk. It's interesting because when I came back, so much emphasis was placed on Bishop Strickland's speech at that event. And I thought, I, I stood there, I listened to it. It wasn't that big of a deal, in my opinion. So much emphasis was placed on Bishop Strickland. The whole the fact that he read this letter from a friend, you know, got all the world's attention, especially from those who oppose Bishop Strickland, obviously. Well, I would say you should pay better attention to the speech that Cardinal Mueller gave at that talk, at that conference. It was a lot more interesting, in my opinion. And here we have an article where they're asking very detailed questions about the current state of affairs in the church. And I find this fascinating because the one thing that I've said to Ed Maza and to others who to hold the position which I do not agree with, their position being that Pope Francis isn't a legitimate pope because he has, he has excommunicated himself either through promulgation of heresy or that his, his election was not canonically normal, so therefore it violated the canon law and he's not pope. Whatever their arguments are, I've always maintained that um, well, we're, he's, he's the pope, whether, whether that's true or not, in my opinion, because every cardinal on planet Earth says he's pope. Every bishop makes their, their ad limita visits to him. He, he is running the show, and we have to live with the consequences of the pontificate. Whether you agree to it or not is almost beside the point, in my opinion. And, of course, I've quoted you know, Bishop Athanasius Schneider, Cardinal Mueller, P Burke, and others in that regard. But in this article... Cardinal Mueller seems to be getting ever so closer to that edge. In fact, I'm asking the question right now over on, on YouTube, which is the place that allows me to put polls out. Do you think we will see a Western schism? 88% say yes right now. 12% say no. So if you want to vote on that, you can go to the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Scroll down to the live video player. And just underneath that, you'll see an icon for YouTube. You can click on that. And that is where you can leave your vote for the poll. Or you can just put it in the comm box and we'll read that in the after show as well. But let me just go over a little bit. I think maybe skip to the pertinent part of this article with Cardinal Gerhard Mueller. Uh, Cole DeSantis is the one who's interviewing him. And I find it interesting. Let me just read at least the questions to you. I'm not going to read it all to you. I'm going to put a link to it. But it's crisismagazine.com. How would you describe the nature of papal infallibility? Uh, under what circumstances does papal infallibility apply was the first question. And if I'm not mistaken, I see Dr. Anthony Stein jumping on with us now. Dr. Stein, let us know when you can hear us. Uh, good, good morning to you and good to have you on the team. Are you there? Good. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I had a little login problem. <laughs> so, well, glory be to God. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for for doing it. And I'm sorry about that problem. So let's jump right to it with the time that we have. I'm looking at this article by Crisis Magazine uh, on Cardinal Mueller. I, and one of the things I said, just to set a sort of backstory context here, I find it fascinating. I feel like he's edging ever so closer to formally declaring that the Pope is not the Pope. He's not said that, but boy, does it seem like he's getting as close as possible. Do you, do you agree with that? I think he's laying the groundwork so that when the next conclave happens, whenever it is, he can make the case to not get another Francis. 
mm. that he's he, I don't think he will ever come out and call him an anti-pope, but I think he's going to say, look, we can't go through this again, which is why I saw this in passing the other day. And it's a story I need to dig into more. But there are already cardinals from like St. Gallen type car- cardinals already lobbying to get a weak, but Fran- uh, Francis II, who was a weak ruler, meaning will allow the cardinals to just do anything they want because you know i will say one thing in francis's defense right and that is he keeps a tight control on his on what i mean look you know the way he treats the german bishops and these others there are now groups already look uh, that are allied with him who are looking towards the next conclave and they want a weak follow-up to him someone who is ideologically on board but isn't going to get in the way of the Cardinals who want to push things on their own. And on the flip side of that is Cardinal Mueller, who is also looks like he's getting ready for the next conclave, not to make the case for himself, but to just say, look, we can't do this anymore. And that's Mm. the thing that I read about this papal infallibility thing is to make sure that there is a real understanding on how this works. And the other thing that I would like to see him address is the, this idea that the Holy ghost personally chooses each pontiff because we hear this all the time, but it's always said by people who don't know a thing about history, because if you knew a thing about the history of the papacy, you would know that saying that is blasphemous <laughs> because there yeah. are bits of really rotten men on the throne of Peter throughout history. Yeah. You know, I find it fascinating. Cardinal Mueller here seems like he's saying that apostasy is being promulgated by this pontificate. Mm-hmm. And he sort of stops short of saying that basically, like the Ed Mazza, whom I've interviewed a couple of times, Ed Mazza basically makes the case that that would, that would nullify the, his pontificate at that point. And yet I think Cardinal Mueller would be responding in this interview that you, that you talked about in your video, which we're going to link to, by the way. Um, he basically answers that and says, even if that's true, we're stuck. There's no, you can't, you, there's no process to judge the Pope. Only God can judge the Pope. We're stuck with the consequences of the pontificate, whether we like it or not, whether we agree to it or not. We're stuck here. There's nothing we can do besides electing a better Pope in the future who will call a council and deal with this forthwith. Is that, is that basically what he's saying? Basically. I mean, although I would argue that a Pope could he just unilaterally declare that a predecessor all of his acts null and void, invoking the power of the papacy to then judge another alleged holder of the papacy. I don't know that he would need to do a council for that, but I mean, that's what it sounds like. That's what other cardinals like Cardinal Burke have said when he has talked about imperfect councils and things there. It, it, you know that a lot of these of uh, uh, these high profile, more conservative bishops are having these conversations internally about what to do about things. I I like that Cardinal Mueller is saying these things. And the th- other takeaway I had, though, is he also invoked, like, the New World Order and all these other things in this mm, letter. This yeah. letter is incredible. And that sounds like Archbishop Vigano. Like, yeah, Vigano's that, the only other one here talking about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is, I think, what got my attention the most. It seems like Cardinal Mueller is is moving further and further towards that brink. vigano has been on that line for a long time now. But uh, mm-hmm. Mueller, Mueller, this, but what, I think people think of Mueller and they think, oh, he's a he's a he's a traditional conservative cardinal bishop. It, not really. He has not been known for that up until maybe just very recently. He was he was the he was the prefect for the congregation for the doctrine of the faith under this pontificate. <laughs> That's where he was. It was it was his un- unwillingness to continue juggling Catholic doctrine and Amoris Laetitia together. That was what got him removed from that position back in 2016 or 2017. And even then afterwards, he defended Pope Francis a lot for a long time after that. It just it's he's not he's not defending him anymore. Other than that, to when someone asks if he's the Pope, he says yes. He still says that. That's about yeah. the extent of his defense anymore. Yeah, so I guess, so he's he's basically he's coming to the point where it's like, speak now or forever hold your peace? I, almost. It's almost what it looks like. And I don't, I don't offhand remember how old Cardinal Mueller is, but I knew, I'm pretty sure he's getting close to aging out of the of the conclave process. I need to quickly take a look to see Cardinal Mueller's age. And that's one of those things you have to bear in mind is how he's 76, right? So 
there are people who would like to see him pope. I don't think you're going to, the next Pope is either going to be a John the 23rd older placeholder, calm the fires of internal division in the church down kind of figure, mm-hmm. or they're going to go for somebody younger who can be there for a very long time. Mm-hmm. I, I don't see, I don't see, and I don't think Mueller is one that you're likely to see just because when you, 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 if you go read articles about him from 10 years ago, from more conservative and traditional sources that there's not glowing things said about Cardinal Mueller. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just put yeah. it that way. It's yeah. just that he's had he's had the en- enough of the heterodoxy too much for him to to just abide by anymore. Yeah, I always thought it was funny when when people would refer to Cardinal Dolan as a conservative. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I have a friend who okay. thinks that who thinks that Cardinal Dolan could be like a a moderate to conservative type figure. But remember, Cardinal Dolan would would happily go and rub shoulders with Joe Biden and Barack Obama. So. Yeah. Yeah. And this isn't yeah. the awkward handshake when they come to visit, you know, come to when we when at those public events where you as a cardinal have to go to that they happen to be at. No, this is the happy to take the group picture with them, right? Right. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so it's interesting. You a minute ago you talked about we're gonna run out of time very quickly here, but you talked about how that in the next conclave there's a good chance we're gonna get a weak bishop. Uh, as as Pope, and uh, that would play into the hands of uh, of the progressives that are trying to push their agendas uh, across the whole church. It's interesting because Edward Penton, when I was in Rome, basically said that we could see a uh, a cardinal who is say modernist uh, get elected, but would not want to go through the kind of turmoil, stress, scandals. Uh, because they just don't have the backbone or the courage to to uh, so to keep that agenda moving forward. He said we might even be surprised that a man that we thought was in one column might move. Could like a, a could there be another sleeper Cardinal Mueller out there? That I mean that could happen. Um, I I try I try not to think too much about the next conclave because I do t- I I tend to think that Francis will be around for longer than most people think. Yeah, I and agree. that's a good thing because that, you should, yeah. that gives you more time to pray for him. Yeah, he's going to yeah, – yeah, amen. Praise – well well said. We'll leave it there. Hey, Dr. Stein, I'm sorry about the connection issues. Glad you got on. If you can come back at the top of the hour, we'd love to have you back for the after show. We can continue our conversation there. We're going to link to uh, Anthony Stein's uh, video on this very subject in the show notes today, so make sure to check that out at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. We'll also include a link to the – interview itself with cardinal mueller so you can read his direct le- uh, his direct words as well again the station of the cross.com forward slash act coming up after the break layla miller is on calling out those dirty old men make that great again we'll be right back don't go anywhere please join father mark noonan in praying the litany of humility O Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being loved, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being extolled, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred to others, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being despised, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of suffering rebukes, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being calumniated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being forgotten, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being ridiculed, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being wronged, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being suspected, deliver me, Jesus. That others may be loved more than I, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be esteemed more than I, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I may decrease, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be chosen and I set aside, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be praised and I unnoticed, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be preferred to me in everything. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may become holier than I, provided that I may become as holy as I should. 
Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. Amen. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Tick, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. Ground News reports U.S. personnel wounded in missile attack on Iraq airbase. An Iran backed militia targeted the Al Assad airbase in western Iraq with ballistic missiles and rockets, resulting in injuries to several U.S. military personnel. The group claiming responsibility for the attack called the Islamic Resistance in Iraq emerged in 2023. The incident marks the second time ballistic missiles have been used to attack U.S. forces amid increased threats from Iranian-backed Shia militias. I bet you didn't even know U.S. forces were still in Iraq. I thought we left. Anyway, CNA reports Bishop in Louisiana dies unexpectedly at 63. Let us pray for his repose. Bishop Mario Dorensville of the Diocese of Homa Thibodeau in southeastern Louisiana died unexpectedly on Friday evening after serving as bishop in the diocese for less than a year. The vicar general of the diocese wrote that the bishop passed after he had given in to complications arising from recent health problems. Dorsville was appointed the Bishop of the Diocese in February the 1st, 23, and Pope Francis had named him the Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Washington back in 2015. He was ordained to the Episcopate a month later by the former Archbishop of the Diocese, Cardinal Donald World. And Lepanto Institute is reporting that John Paul II Academy for Human Life and the Family formally requests Pope Francis to dismiss Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez. The John Paul II Academy for Human Life and the Family, of which Michael Hitchborn is a member, calls for the dismissal of Cardinal Fernandez. The Academy feels obliged to express its astonishment and perplexity that Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez has accepted the role of prefect for the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, despite having in past decades written scandalous books of an erotic nature that which border on pornography and which contain passages that clash with the traditional teaching of the church. Quote, these scandalous episodes show that Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez does not have the necessary minimum qualities required to fulfill the role of defender of the faith. For this reason, the Academy formally asks the Holy Father to dismiss him and appoint in his place a competent theologian faithful to the moral teachings of the church, close quote. And those, those are your headline news. Praise be to God. Joining us right now is uh, Layla Miller. She has a great website. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, LaylaMiller.net, LaylaMiller.net. We'll put a link to it in the show notes, but she's also got a great article over Crisis Magazine, crisismagazine.com. Let's call out dirty old men again. Layla, good morning to you. Thank you for your time today. Good morning. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you. I am old enough to remember a time when, uh, you know, calling out the perverts was like a a normal societal thing, right? Like it was not only socially acceptable, some would argue it was required in good decency to call out the perverts in society. Like the guy who would try to look up women's skirts or peek through bathroom stalls or like you wouldn't tolerate that thing in society, but the times they they really have changed haven't they oh yeah i would say um if they flipped on their head i call it a whole an unholy inversion where now the people who are um protective of children as far as not allowing them to be sexually exploited or sexually um, exposed to things um or uh people who have the instinct to know that yeah this guy may be walking down the street in a parade with no clothes on and um, you know, again, I want to keep this G-rated, uh, but mm. those people who want to call that out, now we are suddenly the dangerous ones in society. People who are, um, you know, kind of go along with the traditional decency values that we used to have, moms, grandmas, you know, fathers, and we are the ones who are seen as uh, subversive or dangerous to other people. So it, it's, it's quite the flip, yes. You know, in your article, you talk about the sex abuse scandal of 2002 up in Boston. I was there at the time, and I've talked about this a number of times on my program and, and the, how that affected me when I was reading the headlines. The, the bishop who who uh, laid hands and confirmed me uh, admitted his own guilt in covering up homosexual priests in the Archdiocese of Boston. 
And the scandal that that just rocked the church. It today it's still it's still reeling from that scandal. Many churches are darn near empty up there. It's pretty sad. And uh, and yet, in despite the fact that Uncle Ted gave us the Dallas Accords back in 2004, um, it, it we still have now the scandal of Cardinal Fernandez and his erotic writings. Like it, despite the fact that we've had now a few decades of scandal laden sexual perversion within the ranks of the clergy and movies have been made against this you, you see what i'm saying like society railed against us called us all perverts and basically condemned all of us for being catholic and now we're going to accept this we're just we're okay with this now like how did like what diabolical nonsense has had to happen in order to make that okay yeah, I call it like a hydra, you know, the minute, because uh, I, I was, I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, at two, 2002, people thought, oh, a few bad actors, you know, this is terrible, but now we've really, we're going to clean up our act, and gosh, all the parents are going to go through safe environment training, because that'll take <laughs> yeah. care of the problem. Yeah. We, you know, and then we kind of said, but, you know, the majority of the bishops, they're going to take care of it, because this is just, they're not going to put up with this, everybody's, they're, they're still pretty decent. Then we find out, you know, McCarrick's scandal, which we can't even begin to scratch the surface of what he has done done to people and and the long lasting effects of just just his heinous crimes mm -hmm. um but they throw him under the bus which by the way he still hasn't had any punishment for that other than just going to live in a you know monastery somewhere um right. but uh he he was he was the you know the head we cut off the hydra and then all these other heads bring it up in its place and they're still in power and probably i would argue that the what i call you know what people call the lavender mafia are, are more powerful than ever you know, practically every one of our cardinals, uh, you know, is one of McCarrick's handpicked men. So you've got all this going on. Uh, we're supposed to now, instead of saying, hey, we call out these, you know, perverts and these bad guys in our, our ranks, uh, including the, the laity, now, like you said, we are expected to just shut up about it because these are the, um, the welcoming uh, people, the ones who accompany uh, – uh, folks with, uh, you know, again, other public sexual issues and things like that. And we're just supposed to go along with it. So what is going on? It's, it's just, have we learned nothing from mm -hmm. McCarrick and all the grooming scandals? And apparently not, because we're not allowed to, we're really not allowed to speak about it. It's, it's um, uh, again, we are the mean, terrible, horrible, nasty ones that are uh, oppressing right. people. You say in your article today, the acts of grooming and sexualizing children are not only tolerated, but are considered as positive good. If you don't believe me, then you haven't watched any preschool shows in a while, nor have you been involved in public schools, not frequented a library. If you need to be shaken awake, please do go here and you put a link there. And again, we're going to link to this article over crisismagazine.com. But uh, you say, there's a you give a little tiny example and it's, and it's gross, right? Like it would, to have to even talk about these things is gross. And it just uh, man, boy, love has grown in popularity in the last decade. I mean, there are people lobbying to make it normal and acceptable and okay for adults to sexualize children. But 20 years ago, when when uh, these alleged priests were victimizing children, that was so horrible that the whole world needed to burn it all down. And now, fast forward, again, there's just a, such a diabolical flip in that that should astonish us. In your article, you mentioned Uncle Ted McCarrick. You just talked about that a minute ago. Monsignor Jeffrey Burrell. Let's not forget about his his hookup app, uh, you know, adventures. Bishop Z uh, Zaketa, who was protected by the uh, the Vatican for a while. Father Rupnik, whose excommunication was personally lifted by Pope Francis and is still in good standing when Bishop Strickland has just lost his job. Archbishop Paglia, Jesuit Father James Martin, Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez made your list. And I'll add, um, Layla, uh, Cardinal Coco Palmero. Mm. Um he was involved oh, yeah. in a very disgusting event at a Vatican apartment, and I saw him back in October, and I was shocked just to see his physical presence. Just shocked me, just standing there. It was just crazy. Like, there is this, then there's even more names that on this list that you could have added that you didn't, probably out of prudence. But just this list is shocking, Layla. Yeah, and these aren't just minor players, you know, out there somewhere in, uh, you know, a tiny little uh, clapboard church in Nowheresville. I mean, these are the people who run the Catholic Church right now. I mean, they are in the highest positions of power. 
um, they basically laugh at us. You know, people who are <laughs> like you and me who are who are concerned and protective. I mean, that's a word that we, you know, again, I said in the article that it, 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 there's no one protecting in the way that a protective man, for example, would protect against perverts and deviants. Uh, in the in the old days, we we have to just be quiet. So everybody's been quiet when these folks still, no matter what, it, it seems to be no matter what their deeds are, no matter how bad their sexual crimes, they are untouchable. They just yeah. stay in power, like you say. We see them; they're still around. Some people say, you know, Mahoney in in Los Angeles is still running the place. I mean, he's still behind right. the scenes running running things, and he should he was supposed to be put out to pasture uh, years ago. So all these yeah. guys are in firm control, <laughs> and we we just have to wonder. Wait, wait, wait. Wh- why do we have to be quiet about this again? Not that necessarily we have any power to change things, um, mm-hmm. but we certainly have a voice, and we can speak with our voice. Um, and and that, in fact, many saints have said, it, uh, silence is 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 the cause of of ruin in this world. We need to speak with a thousand tongues. So at least put the truth out there. Let me. I'm going to ask a. I'm going to ask a, a dumb question, uh, but I think it's important. I've often wrestled with this in trying to wrap my head around what motivates these these perverts, these characters. Do you believe that they sincerely believe that they should embrace these worldly, fleshly, perverted ideas? I mean, they're doing it. They do, do they do that out of a sense of sincerity? They just believe, mistakenly believe this. They're naive. They're misled, or whatever. Or do they have some real animosity, some real envy, some real uh, diabolical motivation for perpetuating this this horribleness upon the rest of the church? So my theory is that um, it's kind of like in secular politics. I think that there are a lot of people who just are um, naively carrying the water, you know, of these new ideas or whatever. But I think that the further up you get, um, as far as like a, a lot of these cardinals, if you really ever talk to them or listen to what they're saying or look in their eyes, I mean, the, they're. I think I've used the word sinister. I mean, there's a there's a sinister mm-hmm. quality here. They go after good, faithful Catholics. Um, you know, they don't like reverence. They don't like tradition. They don't like the church. It doesn't appear. You know, they don't like the moral law. And you can't really be in that position for too long and climb those ranks without really being a true believer that these that that good is is you know good is bad and that they're going to advance that now to the extent that they are diabolically influenced I'm sure some of them are some of them really appear to be in the throes of the devil and uh, these are not nice people a lot of times they're not behind the scenes they're not nice some of them are fine you know and maybe they're just stupid and they just don't know any better and they have inclinations that they just think oh it would be really nice if we could all just you know love who we want to love whatever that they never define love I don't even want to think about what the definition is Um, but uh, but I do think there's a sinister quality to many of these uh, men and I think that they are you know serving a different master and I'm Mm. not gonna you know pretend that that's not the case because it's I'm most certainly. I, I am. I am certain that is the case in some in some of these guys. You mentioned Father uh, James Martin in your article as well. You know his valid point too. It's one thing to meet people where they're at, but they never try to take them where they got to go. There seems to be no positive confirmation of what the church teaches in regards to human sexuality and identity. Instead, it's just oh, meet them where they're at and, and just you know be friends with them. Like, that's fine and all if you're going to get them to decide through discipleship to where they got to go, but they never get there, do they? Yeah, and with Father James Martin, um, and I've followed him for years, I, I've, I've watched his social media. I've watched people respond to him in the, in the thousands, you know, underneath. He's got, he's got millions of followers, I'm sure, that admire him. But if you watch what they say and if you watch what he says, uh, they never uh, – say, oh, Father, thank you, I, I have changed. You know, I have repented of my sin. Right. I, am, I am a right. new man. Oh, those of us who had conversions like that, we say it all the time. You know, we're always yeah. like, thank you, Jesus, for changing my life. I got out of mortal sin, and I, um, but not not James Martin and his followers. And he always toes this line. I call him slithery because he's, he's said a few <laughs> things that are really, really yeah. slithery, and they really uh, belie what's going on underneath. Layla, Layla Miller, hold that thought. Um, we're having a great conversation about her article over at Crisis Magazine. Let's call out dirty old men again. Crisismagazine.com. 
is the uh, is the website there. We're going to put a link to it in the show notes. But her website, her personal website, is LaylaMiller.net. L e i l a, LaylaMiller.net. More on this. What do we do about all of this? That is coming up next with Layla Miller. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. More is coming. the Station of the Cross, we proudly bring the truths of the Catholic faith to countless listeners through radio and mobile devices, and we're grateful for the feedback we've received. I discovered the Station of the Cross rather providentially a year ago. I've been a loyal listener ever since. I can't overestimate the value of the station, but it's made a difference in my life in terms of making me better informed Catholic. It has enriched my faith and sold me during tough times. It made me laugh on several occasions. I commend the important work of this great apostolate. I'm a stay-at-home mom. I listen to the radio. And if I can listen to something that brings me closer to God, closer to Jesus Christ, then it's the most beautiful thing. If you've been blessed by listening to the Station of the Cross, let us know. Call 1-877-888-6279, extension 112. Then share your testimonial with us. Hear a powerful sermon you need to share with a loved one? Maybe there's a guest, prayer, or teaching segment that deserves another listen. You can listen to any of our network-produced programs at your convenience by finding us wherever you enjoy podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podbean, and the free iCatholic Radio app. Be uplifted in your faith. Listen today at thestationofthecross.com or on your favorite podcasting platform. Hi, I'm Debbie Giorgiani. And I'm Adam Bly. Join us for the spirit world on the Station of the Cross. If we're really going to suffer, we really need to suffer here when we're in the church militant phase, right? The most difficult part for the poor soul is that they have some amount of that beatific vision in their judgment. They know they're going to get back to God, but then they're separated from God. So that's kind of the worst part because that's a spiritual suffering. The spirit world every Saturday at 11 a.m. right here on the Station of the Cross. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. We've got a little straw poll going over on YouTube asking the question, do you think that we will see a Western schism? Many believe so. 85% of the polls say yes so far. 15% say no. Again, you can leave your comment there uh, either in the chat boxes or the live video feeds and just let us know. We'll read those in the after show coming up at the top of the hour. Or you can actually vote in the poll just by going to the, the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Scroll down to the live video player. And just under that, you'll see icons for the various places that we live stream every day. Uh, YouTube being one of them. You can find that there. Again, the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Layla Miller is our guest. She has an article over at crisismagazine.com. Let's call out dirty old men again. Layla, welcome back to the show. You know, just this morning I read that Cardinal Fernandez is not only not being replaced or asked to resign, and there's been a global call for it, but nonetheless, he's got an additional appointment. He's now also being appointed to the, the Castry for Christian Unity. So seems like he's moving on up. In fact, Layla, many people believe Cardinal Fernandez could be a potential, you know, what, what do you call it? Uh, pa pa I can't remember the term, pa uh, like Papalia? Papalia. Yeah. yeah. Whatever that is. Yeah, like, he could be the next pope. Could you imagine, that's, Layla, that's that sad. Cardinal Fernandez it would be a pope next? That would, like, I, that would definitely bring schism, I would have to argue. What do you think? I can't think of much more uh, that would be. Uh, that is the most horrifying thought. <laughs> yeah, right. I, exactly. I've been every conspiracy theory, you know, would come true. I mean, I just, it's just crazy. It's crazy to think that this pervert, really, he's a he's a porn monger, um, you know, it's kind of a disgusting, I, again, I, I, we're talking minors. This was a discussion with a minor he was having as a priest. I don't even want to think about uh, you know, how that came about and all this it, it just blasphemous porn. I, I, I can't imagine that he would ascend to the throne of Peter. That would be just really wild. You know what was crazy then? He, his response, his follow-up to that story, which we, I covered that. I was sent that book in the middle of the night and had to 
had to read parts of it. My wife was not happy that I had to read parts of that book, by the way, because yeah. it was just, it's that bad. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I, I, I covered that story. The next day, Cardinal Fernandez responded to everybody who covered that story. And basically he said that uh, he canceled it himself because he knew it was bad. Well, why is you right if you knew it was bad, number one? Number two, he said the Pope knew about it in advance and still appointed him to the office. What should that tell us about the current state of affairs? That the Pope knew that this book existed and still appointed him to be the chief of dogma. Yeah, in my opinion, it means that the, the level of corruption is just staggering because um, I, we're already reeling from all these other appointments, you know, these other friends of Francis, and these are not good guys. These are people with incredible history of sexual deviancy, sexual crimes, cover-ups. I mean, they again, they should be out in, in some monastery in sackcloth and yeah. ashes for the rest of yeah. their lives, and, and they're Amen. in the public eye. It's almost like... It's almost like we're being gaslit, you know. We're we're being, um, right. you know, this, we're being played here and we're being trolled. We keep saying we're we being trolled, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yes. and and you know possibly so. So I, uh, yeah, it's it's pretty disturbing that now he's going to get another appointment because it just shows that. Um, you know, our concerns don't matter, and we don't have any power in, in the sense of, you know, this type of power where we can say as a group, stop, you know, appointing these people. That's obviously not going to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, so so we have other types of power, but that's not that's not something we can control, unfortunately. But we can see it, and we can see it clearly and not be mm. um, fooled. Yeah, and this makes life harder for all of us who are in the public, who defend our faith who, uh, you know, do apologetics work or try to evangelize our friends, our family, our communities, or strangers, or what have you. This is all making that incredibly hard. So what do we do about all of this? What can we do as lay people? I mean, I'm just a knuckle dragger with an opinion. That's about the extent of my authority. So what ought we to be doing, Layla Miller? Mm, yeah, and I'm the same. I'm a housewife in Phoenix. You know, I have an opinion. Uh, well, we have the benefit of knowing our faith, and knowing um, what came before, we know 20 centuries of Catholic patrimony. Um, first of all, we have to learn it. We have to teach our children in our own sphere of influence, our own children, our own families, our own friends. We have to teach them. Um, I always have a, a rule of thumb, which is uh, what would the saints have said on this particular topic? Not just what would the saints have said, because people twist that to be like, well, the saints said love. You know, we have to love. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, okay, no, no. <laughs> what would the saints say, and what did they say on these per and any particular topic? You have mm. to be very specific. And then you realize, okay, well, that's pretty consistent, you know, 20 centuries, 2,000 years. Um, we're going to go with whatever the saints said because they knew and they lived the faith better than, um, than you know, we're here still trying to, trying to figure it all out. But we know because we have that patrimony. We know what they said. We know what the... Uh, what the church has taught. We know what the moral law is. Nothing, nothing changes. That doesn't change. So if we find something that contradicts that, we can be fairly sure that that's the problem. That's the aberration, not what the saints have said, not what the church has taught for 20 centuries. So the rule of thumb is just look back in the past and see if it's got any, if this is an inversion or if it's, it's, it's compatible with it. And, um, and then we have to become saints ourselves because the only way we can be powerful within the church and with, you know, God is on our side if we are speaking the truth, is to be prayerful, is to, um, you know, become virtuous and saintly and, and have a very firm prayer life because a saint can change a community, a saint can change a nation. So we just need a few saints, and that would change a lot of things for a lot of people. You know, there are, there's a strong influence within Catholic media. I've been in Catholic media now a very long time. And there's a strong influence to not talk about the scandals. Don't touch that third rail. Don't upset the apple cart. Just talk about joy and things that make you feel good. And, you know, uh, just the sunshine, right? A centering prayer or whatever other stuff that they mm -hmm. want to sort of focus on. I can't do that anymore. I've said it now very plainly. Uh, the summer of shame, you actually mentioned that. You usually use that. The summer of shame in 2018, Uncle Ted changed that for me. I professionally can no, no longer do that. I have to. I feel obligated to to call a spade a spade. So, I mean, but is it from a psychological uh, health perspective, how much time should we be spending sort of focused on these really scandalous stories, these, this really negative stuff? How do we find that balance, I guess is what I'm asking. 
Right, and self-awareness is really important here in St. Catherine of Siena, uh, in here dialogue. God the Father says that a lot, you know, self-knowledge. So you really have to know how it's affecting you. Um, you know, if, if it gets to me, I back off for a little while. I'm, I'm one of these people who I'm kind of, I don't mind, it's not shaking my faith at all to go into these matters. Um, I, I'm more excited than ever to be a Catholic, you know. I don't know. I'm, they're not going to take my mother's mm. house, you know. They're not going to take my father's house. So uh, it, does, it hasn't shaken my faith. However, I know many people who have told me I, I'm, I'm so shaken. And then I just want to say, well, just back off. Don't, don't even wade into that. Go read, go read the saints. Go read their writings. Go read, the, you know, scripture. Dive into everything that came before, and your mind will start to be cleansed of all this garbage that is coming out of the Vatican and the different chanceries now. Just even go there. You know, who, you know yourself. So if you can't handle it, it's not that you're putting your head in the sand. You already know, right? You already know it's bad. So now go and be that prayerful person that just uh, dives into all of the faith, the, the wonderful parts of our faith, to make you grow deeper in that faith and become a saint. We need the saints. We need the prayer warriors. And then th- those of us who can handle all these disgusting details without mm. losing our faith, we can go forward and, and keep speaking. But, um, but yeah, is, do not lose your faith over this. Absolutely not. Know your limits with the, with the intake. Yeah. And I think the opposite uh, side of that uh, spectrum might be those too many Catholics who just accept whatever comes as, out of the Vatican. As, it must be good. It must be ordained. It must be holy. That, that's not the answer either, people. Okay? No. No, <laughs> we have to use, the answer. We have to use some prudential judgment here. Hey, we're out of time. Layla Miller, so grateful to have you on the show today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for getting up early and being a part of the conversation. Let's call out Dirty Old Men again is the article at crisismagazine.com. And also, we're going to link to her website, laylamiller.net. That's L-E-I-L-A, laylamiller.net as well. Catholic author, check that out in the show notes over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash A-C-T. Layla Miller, God bless you. God love you. Thank you again for being on. Thank you so much. God bless you. All right, we're going to go into the after show and get your take. Right now, 86% say we could be facing a Western schism. What's your opinion? Your opinion comes up next, plus Dr. Anthony Stein in the after show. We'll see you back here tomorrow morning. God love you. So what did you think of today's show? Let's discuss that right now in the after show. Your take on the after take. Comment. Interact live with me and the team. All you need to do is search for one of our live video feeds on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, Twitter, LinkedIn, and elsewhere. Simply search for The Station of the Cross, Joe McLean, or A Catholic Take. I'm looking forward to seeing you and interacting with you directly. It all starts right now. It's The After Show. And we are back. Welcome to The After Show, everyone. Good morning, everybody. Cindy Kay, good morning to you. And Janice and Paul. Eileen, Sharon, good morning, everybody. Mimi is here. I see Luz as well. Jen Nugent, good morning to you. Uh, Kathleen, good morning to you. Yvonne, praise be to God, good morning to you. Damon is here, of course. Damon never sleeps. He's always up. Uh, Poor fella. I mean, uh, he will sleep when he is dead, I think is probably what he would say. Uh, but I'm glad you're here. Praise be to God. Chesty Marine here. Good morning. Semper Fi, Chesty. Good morning to you. Uh, Anthony, uh, good morning to you. Uh, Tina, Diane, Deborah, Alberto. Surprise Puppies is back. Round one. Good morning to you. Female Casey Royals fan. Uh, Caleb the Mechanic. Kilroy Jones. Good morning to you guys. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Praise be to God. I'm glad to see you guys. You guys get, get a chance to vote. Let us know. If you didn't, or if you got, like, uh, I think it was Angel Knight said, he wishes there was a middle ground in my poll. Okay, fair enough. I was also trying to tap it out as quickly as possible before the show started, so, yeah, there you go. But if you have a middle ground option, like, yes or no, you are somewhere in the middle, l- just put that in the comments. I don't try to read it. Don the Highlander, good morning to you. Sharon, good morning to you. Uh, Evelyn, good morning to you. Thank you for hanging out with us today. Brandon <laughs> Joseph, Jay Coke, good morning, Aiden Murphy. Uh, Pola Chicho is in the house. Good morning to you, my friend. God, I was just thinking about you the other day. Praise be to God. Uh, glad glad you're here. Have you guys ever heard of El Fago Baca? I got remind me sometime to tell you the story of El Fago Baca. Hey, Ho- Honey West twenty five is here. Sci Fi Mike, Robert De Bruce, Cherokee Woman two O. Good morning to you, James sixteen eight nine seven. Thanks for hanging out on Rumble. If you're on Rumble and you've not commented. 
join the team. Leave a comment. Let us know where you're from. Junior Barra, Jane, Patty, Jesus Robles. Good morning to you. Uh, glad you guys are here. Praise be to God. PC, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out. Dr. Stein is back. Uh, welcome back. Thanks for hanging out. No problem. Glad Praise to be, be always, happy to be in, always happy with the invitation. Uh, let's, let's get you to weigh in on the... Uh, on the on the straw poll I'm taking on YouTube today, I asked the question: Do you think we will face a Western schism? Eighty five percent say yes right now. Fifteen percent say no. What say you, Anthony Stein? I think we've been in de, de facto schism for a while, but I don't think any of the bishops and cardinals have the you know intestinal fortitude necessary to take such a step. Whether it's a good thing or not, yeah. the schisms should never be a good thing. But then yeah. again, if the implication being the people who would be going, who are in schism, would be the ones who are promoting heresy, right? That's, I mean, that's kind of the implication. Yeah. But do you, I mean, the comment I always get in videos from whenever I present a letter is, you know, this is great. What are they going to actually do besides write letters? Right. Yes. Yes. Is, thank you. Thank you. Right. And so, the, and they're, they're, and I understand that problem, but it's, it goes back to the same reason that it's mostly Americans doing this Catholic commentary. It's because yeah. Americans are, uh, you know, let's go go out and take care of the problem kind of people. Mm -hmm. And the Catholic Church is a hierarchical organization that is not a democracy. Yeah. It's why it's, which, it's, which is why I was very happy when the, uh, the synodal maniacs were starting to call it the synodal church. I'm like, well, you know, at least you're now implying that this is a, something different that you're setting up. You know, they start using language like the new synodal church and things. So we're in a de facto schism. Just, yeah. I don't think you go yourself into schism by just planting your feet and saying no and not moving with the change as a general rule. It's, it's this isn't like the papal infallibility debates, right? Because yeah. papal infallibility debates, groups went to schism over it, but you can go read the fathers of the church and see, you know, Rome has spoken. The case is closed. That, that kind of language being used on issues. So again, this is a little different than previous times. It's interesting that you mention, you know, uh, the whole frustration over the just writing thing. I, I've been saying this now for a few years since the summer of shame. Um, Joe, what are you, you're complaining about these bishops. What do you want them to do? Sackcloth and ashes in St. Peter's square, uh, you know, let's get some attention here. Let's let's do some prayer, fasting, and penance on a on a, a public scale that these men can lead, right? Like I think that would be an important step for them. It, you know, it's when I when I would listen when I would hear about the the retirement of um, of Cardinal or Burke or or uh, the uh, Archbishop Chapu or Mueller or whatever, like Vigano, and I was like. Like it's just words. You got write another book, give another speech. Like it's just words. It's like watching you a really protest. Like to see them it's, do. Like, it's like it's like watching would... a protest in France. It comes and it goes, and then we go back to normal. Nothing ever changes. So I'm like, you know, uh, another book that hardly anybody but the you know the one percent of the Catholic population who takes any interest in this stuff at all is going to read that thing. So how effective will it be? It won't be, is the answer. So obviously something else is required that, to your point, they're not willing to do. Well, the uh, the thought that I just had is, what if we took the highest ranking cardinal who has spoken out against this stuff before, which might be Mueller, probably be Burke, because of the because he still has a position of some kind in the Curia, even though it's very symbolic, it's like the causes of the saints or something. Yeah. What if he led you know, walked into St. Peter's Basilica and did an exorcism. Now, the St. Peter's is, the St. Peter's belongs to the Pope, right? So right, there'd be yeah. a declaration there because only the Pope should be able to exercise, you know, certain of, certain of the basilicas, including, you know, St. John Lateran and, and St. Peter's and whichever one it is that uh, Malachi Martin said that the satanic ritual was done in. Mm-hmm. But it would be a declaration if somebody came in and started doing an exorcism there who wasn't the Roman pontiff. <laughs> but yeah. that would be an interesting thing to see happen if uh, somebody did step in to do an exorcism. Because yeah. you had idolatry there. You've had Anglicans offering their pseudo-Eucharist now in a couple of different of these basilicas. And they're heretics. I mean, they are. <laughs> right? Plus, their orders are dubious. And I say dubious because... 
um, Pope Leo the Thirteenth said they weren't valid, but the response from some Anglican bishops afterwards was to go find uh, you know old Romans or others with valid sacraments to ordain them. Some went to Eastern Orthodox bishops to get ordained, so they're dubious. They're not in some cases they're dubious. I don't like I don't know. It is uh, the Arch Layman of Canterbury? I, I saw somebody call him that, and I can't call him the Archbishop of Canterbury because. <laughs> <laughs> he's a political appointee but that guy he shows up and yeah. he does I, I don't know what his episcopal lineage or whatever i got i got an angry email from somebody saying you know i was very disappointed to see you like referring to the uh protestant uh communion as a snack <laughs> like well yeah. it's not the eucharist yeah I, I, i'm not nice about you know sacrilege and things so well, it's not okay. It lacks charity to pretend something that is wrong is true. That lacks mm -hmm. charity. You are allowing people to persist in their sins, and how is that at all charitable? Right? Um, mm -hmm. it, it's not charity. So we speaking the truth is an act of charity. It's the greatest charity one can do is is lead people to the truth, which is a person, Jesus Christ. And yet, that was one of the things we talked about with Layla Miller in the last segment. You know, people like Father Jesuit, uh, a, a friend of your show, uh, Father James Martin. <laughs> mm -hmm. Didn't you use the Supich was a friend of your show? And then wasn't Martin also? Yeah, in my first year, year or two, it was <laughs> Cardinal Supich, friend, friend of the of channel. Show. I stopped with the joke because I, know. I stopped calling him that because people would almost go, how can he be a friend of your channel? It's hilarious. <laughs> like, it's a joke. I always thought that was funny. I liked that. That was hilarious. Back yeah. before you turned the video on, by the way. Those are the good old days, yeah. return to tradition. But uh, nonetheless, uh, Jesuit uh, Father James Martin is infamous for meeting them where they're at. And he's also infamous for never taking them where they got to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it'd be one thing. He would, ha he would have a solid argument, in my opinion. He would have a solid argument. If he was the guy who smelt like the sheep, so to speak, met people in the difficulties and complexities of their life, the, the grayness of their, of, their, of their dysfunctional lives, but then had the boldness and courage to say, but Christ has come to free you from this sin. Here, let me show you the way. Like, if he said those things, if he did those things, then, you know, commentators like myself would not have much of an argument then, right? Like, because we're not the no. ones stepping out and meeting them where they're at, you know, in that regard. He is, but that's none of us, not what he's none doing. Of us goes after, none of us goes after Courage International for the work they do there. The only time we've ever gone after them was when they surrendered on Fiducia Supplicants, which they did. Yeah, I had Father Murray comment on that last back. week. I was when I read that letter. There's, I was mortified. I was like, "What you of all groups?" I mean, I can't imagine yeah. the angry email they're getting from the from their own the people they work with. Because so I've seen comments from people in my own comment section saying, "You know, I have I deal with this issue, and I I felt betrayed when that document came out because they yeah. could read it and they're literate and they understand what it means. There's no yeah. mental gymnastics." <laughs> That is where we're at. It is uh it is a rough it is a rough go. Hey Don Franco, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Uh says superb interview. Strong faithful Catholic women will help our holy church overcome the looming difficulties. Uh where's the strong faithful Catholic men though, too? We need them both. We need both. It's not either or, it's it's uh, both and. Hey Junior Bar, great interview. Thank you. Uh yeah, appreciate that. Praise be to God. Glad you guys are hanging out with us today. Uh, I saw somebody new in the comments here. KSB, maybe. Uh, I'm scrolling backwards. Scrolling. Back. How do you keep track of all your comments, uh, Anthony Stein? It's like, whew. yeah, man, at your I, level, it must be difficult. I can't. Uh, I can't keep track. People accuse me of you know censoring my comments. I've actually got notification hard. from YouTube. Oh, really? I get comments. For, I get notifications from YouTube saying, "Hey, this person comments." As I click to see what it says, and the comments yeah. gone. It's just pff, gone. I will yeah. remove like comments from Protestants or Orthodox telling people to leave the church. That's an instant gone. Yeah, I will delete that. <laughs> yeah, you know it's interesting. I don't like. Listen, I have an opinion. You can have an opinion. We don't have to agree. That's part of what we should consider the dialogue, right? Like we should be able to dialogue and have a conversation. This is like a good reason for just as an example why I've had like Ed Mazza on the program a couple of times. I don't agree with Ed Mazza's position. He's a smarter man than me, way more qualified than me. Mm -hmm. uh, and he makes very strong technical arguments. I still don't agree with him, uh, but we yeah. should be able to conversate about that. We can respect each other enough to conversate yeah. about it. I don't agree with it. I tend to think it's a little legalistic, but I also think that someday – 
it might be the easiest out for some future ultra based Pope to step forward and say, you know, I could take care of a lot of problems of, you know, 60, 70 years worth of problems in the church by just taking this as my entry point. Yeah. Because uh, it, is it a problem? The ambiguity in that papal res- resignation? Absolutely. Like what the, what was Benedict thinking dressed in white, <laughs> you know, it's writing yeah. things been public at all. Like yeah. if he was, if you're going to, I mean, visiting the Pope, the tomb of St. Celestine, the sixth ahead of time. Right. Yeah. That's a hint of what he was thinking about doing, but what does yeah. St. Celestine, the sixth actually do? He resigned and he went back to a monastery and no one heard from him again. The only people he exactly. ever talked to were his yeah. brothers at the monastery. Yeah. I don't understand then, what you're talking about. Dr. Stein. I mean, all Benedict did was live in a monastery at the Vatican, wearing white, keeping the ring, all of the titles, and bishops came to visit him. Other than that, what could be your problem? I don't understand. And giving interviews in the media occasionally. (laughs) Much to Archbishop Gonswine's chagrin and detriment, apparently. Yeah. But that's the way it goes. I will um, will admit that one one of the things I got wrong, I will admit, is that I thought Archbishop Gonswine was sort of like a a handler for him. Until Francis completely threw him under the bus. (laughs) And then I was like, okay, then he's probably not a handler. (laughs) I'm still of the opinion that he was a handler. He just got eaten by his own. I I mean, that's my Mm. my take on it. Um, it, I always thought it was an unwitting handler. Well, sure. I'm not saying he was like a sinister character of any kind. I'm not trying to suggest that, but I also don't think he was naive. Um, But the very fact that he was. Going back and forth in those first, you know, handful of years between Francis and Benedict, what does that tell you? You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. the fact that Benedict the Sixteenth again lived at the Vatican, kept the titles, kept the ring. It was a different ring, I know, but it was still a ring, uh, a papal ring, and uh, wore the white and received visitors. People wanted to hear his opinion, and the same attendant attended. Francis and Benedict. I mean, you can, you don't like, if it walks like a duck, it walks like a duck. It's a duck. That's why it wouldn't surprise me if in 10 or 15 years we get a good Pope who decides he's, who decides they're going to take, try to figure out how to fix the post conciliar era, even if that means tinkering with Vatican II documents and things to get rid of ambiguity and make them orthodox, because there are problems in Lumen Gentium. I mean, I'm not the one saying that. Bishop Schneider says that, right? It, yeah, so it wouldn't exactly, surprise yeah. me if they took Doctor some modified version of Doctor Ed Maza's thesis and ran with it. Because mm. if hypothetically, if Francis was declared null and void, an anti-pope because or some other term because whatever reason, and mm. all of his acts were considered null and void, do you know kind of an earthquake that would be in the church? Big one. Think about that yeah. for a second, and think about the implications. All acts done undone. We're not just talking, you know. Traditionus Custodus and Fiducia Supplicans and these other things. We're talking canonizations. And a lot mm. of the canonizations were simply done because people they were responding to public pressure. Oh, and I'm, I, I, I hope I, we never have another yeah. I hope we never have another papal uh another papal uh elevation to a, a canonization. For until so until the Pope in question, whoever yeah. it is, has been gone for decades and decades and decades instead of this uh, I, popular uh, stuff. Yeah, I have no doubt. So I, I, I have strong opinions about the whole canonization thing. I it, It's obviously become very political, internal church politics, mm-hmm. power, power positioning. You want your guy, you want your gal to get the nod, right? So you yeah. so, you know, the you can you can create a lobby that puts that pressure on to get your guy or your gal through the process to get the nod. And that helps your cause. It helps your institution, your religious community or, or whatever, um, you know, grow. Now you got a saint that you can use for your backing. So there's a lot of political pressure in turn internal into the church that is uh, driving that those decisions these days. I mean, why in the world would JP2 get rid of the office of the devil's advocate, like the position of the devil's advocate in the cause of canonization saints? Why would you do that? It's the one. And then they brought in like a watered down have. version of that. Right. Like why would it's the one guarantee you have to make sure that that guy or that gal actually is worthy of it. You know what I mean? To make such a declaration. The, water, it, the watered so down scandalous. version they did of that was scandalous too. 
the watered down version of a devil's advocate they brought in, at least under one kit situation, was scandalous. Mm-hmm. It was they brought in an atheist, public atheist, who was a high profile person who hates the church to try to argue against the canonization of Mother Teresa. Regardless of what you may think about Mother Teresa, having Christopher Hitchens be play the role of devil's advocate was grotesque. Like, yeah. what were these people thinking? The pr- right. pr- previous versions of a devil's advocate was always some cardinal who would go in, make the case, dig up all the dirt they can, and then they'd go to confession afterwards. Yeah. That was their job. Yeah, yeah exactly. And that is a much better system. Yeah. Uh, and I wish they'd make, it, uh, make the devil's advocate great again, I say. Wish well, you get hats made. Hey, Evodio, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Sci-Fi Mike says, you think they won't throw their own under the bus? Oh, yeah. Ask Betchy how he's feeling right now. Uh, isn't that the way forces for evil work? It's ultimately a self-destructive path. Yes, I would agree. It is a self-destructive path. By the way, Robert D. Bruce says, good morning. Thanks for having Anthony Stein on the show today. Of course. I mean, uh, we have to beg the guy to be on, but nonetheless, we're glad he's here. Praise be to God. <laughs> I'm, I'm only teasing. He's very your, your, good. Your show's the easiest one for me to be on because your show is the easiest one for me to be <laughs> on because you're, a, you're, you're, a, I'm not like everybody on YouTube is like, Hey, want to come on at like 11 o'clock at night? I'm like, no, <laughs> exactly. Yes. It's funny. I'm old. I sleep. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. How many times, uh, people I'll ask people to be on the show. And they're like, Oh, well that's, that's a little too early for me. Uh, can we do that at like say the crack of noon or something? I'm like, no, you're on you the can radio get out of bed. You can get out of bed one day out of the week. Ain't going to kill you. All right. Layla Miller, by if the way, if a, politician if, a pol- if a politician can show up on a Sunday morning on those Sunday morning shows, those news shows right. at five right. in the morning, you can do, you right. can do it. Come yes. On. It's like, it's called radio people. Uh, Layla Miller, by the way, was up at four 30 in the morning to be on the program. So uh, anytime mm-hmm. someone complains about having to get up early, I'm like, I just do. Oh, that's cute. That's nice. Uh, Layla Miller got up at four. Yeah, what time do you get, up, like, do you get out of bed, Joe? Uh, I, what time I are you up in the I'm morning? Three fifty in the morning every day. Okay, uh, yeah. but that's be- it's, it's better. Uh, a year like a, a year ago at this time, as I was leaving my former apostolate to come to work for this one, I was ha- I had to be up at three a.m. So I got fifty extra minutes of sleep every day, just changing a uh, change in apostolate. So I was pretty happy about that. Praise be to God. But uh, I have to be in bed by 9 o'clock at night normally in order to get enough sleep. And then even then, as you guys know, even then, it's a, the, the, the morning frog brain is a, is a real uh, pandemic that I have to struggle with every day. Hey, Flying Tigers. Rob was on my show, uh, uh, what was it, last week? Rob was on mm-hmm. a fr- Friday. I loved having Rob, Rob on again, talking about Malachi Martin. That's always a good time. He, uh, he by the way, reminded us that uh, that, that chapel, that that ceremony was performed in was this chapel of saints peter and paul Mm. um flying tiger says i always think of anthony stein as your co-host i think it'd be the other way around by the way rob but that's okay with me uh i do agree it is i do enjoy hanging out with anthony stein he's always a great commentator uh look up look look i'm up at 355 a.m to watch you where where are you janice where do you where are you located on planet earth uh, it's three fifty-five. Are you in California? Not, are you in California? It's not three fifty-five though. In California, it, the show starts at. I guess it starts at four. You're right. So you must yeah. be Cali- Orange County, California. There we go. That's Crystal Cathedral territory, Janice. <laughs> the belly of the beast. The be- <laughs> you ever, you ever, ever think about going and picketing the uh, religious ed conference out there? Oh LA. man. <laughs> I remember uh, I gave a parish I gave a parish mission at a parish in Orange County, California. Orange County, California. Yeah, uh, Saint Irenaeus, I believe, was the parish, and this was years ago. This was just before they began the renovation of Crystal Cathedral, and I and I was out there for like a week, and I remember the parishioners sort of bragging about how they obtained this building, and I was just like. Even then, this was like before the summer of shame. This was, you know, before my red pilling, trad pilling in many ways. And I was just looking at him like, um, that building's ugly. Like, why would you want it? <laughs> you know, like it just boggled Honestly, the mind, but they were so happy about the it. E- and- the easiest in we have with like re- of regular everyday Catholics of goodwill who know that there's something wrong, but they can't put their finger on it. 
is the banality and ugliness of modern ac- of Catholic architecture now. Oh yeah, it's the easiest way. Like, there's a um, a historic mission site about 45 minutes from my house. I've been there before. Uh, Sacred Heart Mission. It's mm. out here where it's like the first site that the Benedictines showed up in Oklahoma, and there the parish is still there, and you can go inside, and they have the an old simple high altar. Oh really? That is more beautiful than most ordinary form table altars. They wow. still have their old uh, high altar. I think they have the table altar still because they they don't offer, that order does not offer the traditional mass, but they still have it. And there's something beauty beautiful in its simplicity there, and it it, it instantly makes it more beautiful than any non cathedral ordinary form parish I've been in. Just mm. full stop. Yeah, yeah. And so it's the easiest end you have. I uh, I was married at the cathedral in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, Bishop McCormick, who was uh, he admitted his own personal guilt in moving uh, predator priests around. Uh, he refused to retire. Um, he went through court battles and everything. He always admitted his guilt, but uh, he said it was his job not to retire. Um, after he did retire, and eventually after he died, thank thankfully uh, the the next bishop, the current occupant. He did an amazing thing. He renovated the cathedral back to its former glory. Because when I <laughs> became when I became a Catholic in 1999 at the Easter Vigil there, it looked like uh, it had been stripped completely. The parishioners built that building in the 1800s, you know, on their off time. They would work at the mill, then they would build the cathedral at night, go home, eat dinner, sleep, get up, do it all over again. And uh and the, at post Vatican II, they stripped all the iconography out of there, all the statuary out of there. It was plain green carpet, vanilla, banal. And it, the the crazy thing is, when I became a Catholic, I had or I lived in Europe. I had already seen some of the cathedrals and the ornate, uh, beautiful churches in Austria, and and it never dawned on me to even ask the question, Anthony, when I was becoming Catholic. I like, I never stopped and said. Hey guys, why is this church so ugly? Like I'd never, like it didn't even cross my mind for some odd diabolical reason. And then uh, last year I did a parish mission in New Hampshire and I took my whole family back because we were, we had lived there. I took my whole family back with me and the parish secretary, by the grace of God, allowed us to spend an hour by ourselves because they had locked the building, hour by ourselves in the cathedral and they renovated the place, ripped out the green carpet, (sighs) brought back the iconography, installed a 14-foot-high altar there that that uh, that was b- designed by the same architect of the original architect of the building from the 19th century and was being sold uh, at auction from a uh, ripped out of a parish in Massachusetts that was closing down. And the parish priest, the rector of the cathedral, bought it with his own money, stored it in a storage facility until he could obtain permission from the bishop to install it. I mean, it was like awe inspiring to see (laughs) that a bishop would be like, you know what? Let's make cathedral great again. And now he's been encouraging the altar rails to come back all over the diocese. Of course, he's got resistance to that, but I'm just totally inspired by that. I mean, we need that That, again. So pray for that bishop because that's a violation of traditionalist custodus. And okay, I didn't want to say people that out loud. That he, I didn't, he, 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 <laughs> I didn't try, want to well, this, I didn't want to bring a highlight we're, to we're that. A, we're a, in a safe spot here, I think. Pray for him to he continues to fly under the radar until the t- yeah. things in the church he's, get better. Because <laughs> he's a good man. He, he, he is a bi ritual bishop. I think that might lend to the story a little bit. But he is a good bishop, Probably good Novus Ordo bishop. That, but that's um, not but, always the case, know, though. Like I knew, a, I know a priest who was bi ritual. He's retired now. But he, um, yeah, he had very real hostility to traditional Catholicism, despite the fact oh, that he also man. had a Byzantine altar cloth, and he actually could say the Byz- Byzantine divine lit- liturgy himself, divine liturgy. So it's it's, it's not always that's a guarantee. Bipolar is what that is. <laughs> that's bipolar almost. Yeah. Uh, but imagine if we were to sell the Crystal Cathedral off and use the money to renovate the parishes. Like amazing things might happen in, the, in that regard. I just never saw, even back in those days, never saw the need or the desire or the point to taking possession of that building and then spending all that money renovating it. 
doesn't make sense to me. Is the Crystal is the Crystal Cathedral a better looking building than the old cathedral in the city? Like, is the old cathedral like some post Vatican no. II or post World War II brutalist bunker looking thing? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Because uh, it might be an upgrade. <laughs> I mean, it may actually be an upgrade. <laughs> I don't wow. know because the um, like I'm I'm from Portland, Oregon originally, and the cathedral there is beautiful. But when you walk in, it's still got that sort of yeah, it's laid out like a like a church and a cathedral should be. But then you got that raised dais that the uh, that all the where the altar is, and there's no high altar there. There's nothing like that. So, mm. and it's weird because what, who's the Archbishop of Portland? Alexander Sample. He taught himself watching reel to reel tape he found in the cathedral attic. He, or the rectory attic, he taught himself the traditional mass, and yet he yeah. doesn't have the ability to say the traditional mass in his own in his own cathedral. He he's a good bishop. I like it. Uh, he is. He's a good. He's a good man. Um, he he walks a tightrope to be sure. Um, you, you well, he's in Portland, how, Oregon. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> Portland, Oregon makes Austin look normal. Um, My fear so is that the other the one other way that the Vatican could use to control good bishops. They haven't done it yet, but that would be to give, make, appoint one of them to a cushy, meaningless job in Rome or somewhere else and get them out of the diocese as they want them to, that they want for someone else. Could you imagine the kind of damage somebody like um, a James Martin type bishop could do in Portland, Oregon? <laughs> Just think about that for a second. Yeah. That could be, that could be a lot yeah. of damage locally. Yeah. It's not so a do anybody want to place, do anybody want to place an in- Anybody want to place an informal non-cash bet that uh, James Martin's going to be made an auxiliary bishop this year? Since Ooh. I expected con- I expected consistory this year. <laughs> Yikes! Yikes! Oh, and if you man, were, it'd bear, probably be San Diego or Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Oh man, that means uh, McElroy's getting um, Mac. Why? Why hasn't McElroy been moved? I mean, San Diego. Is it just because they're keep trying I, to keep a lot Los Angeles surrounded? I mean, oh, can, let me tell you an you, anecdotal you story about, about um, Leon? No, I was thinking of McElroy. of McElroy in San Diego. Um, is like he's it, a isn't cardinal. Mac- isn't McElroy well, LA? Nope. Well, actually, Diego. I can tell you. I can tell you where Cardinal McElroy is probably going to go. Well, let me tell you this anecdotal story first of of uh, of Bishop Gomez. So he was in San Antonio first. I knew him when he was there. Not not well, but I knew him when he was there because I worked for the GRN. And um, it, it was anyway. Long story short, he gets moved to to Los Angeles, and. Uh, I I start the Catholic radio station in Houston back in 2013. Just as Francis was being elected, I'm opening a radio station apostolate uh, because I work for the Guadalupe Radio Network, which owned it. And I started to make my rounds around town, visiting all, every parish, every priest, everyone I could possibly go to meet. Well, I go to meet this uh, particular Opus Dei priest. I won't name his name. Um, who was in Houston at the time. And I set the appointment and I go to meet with him. And he's packing his office up as we're sitting there. I'm like, where, where are you going, Father? He's like, oh, I've, I've been called to Los Angeles. I have to leave. I'm like, oh, man, that's going to upset a lot of people here, being Opus Day. He go, I go, why are you going to Los Angeles? He goes, Gomez called me. He said he is surrounded by wolves and enemies, and he wants at least one friend to watch his back. <laughs> I went, and this was, again, 2013, so we're talking still five years away from the summer shame that changed me professionally forever. You know, so I was just like, what? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Like, what do you mean? Like, it was just so bizarre to hear to hear this priest talk this way. And he did spend a number of years in L.A. And then now I think that same priest is now Opus Dei in, in New York. So he's moved on with his life. Oh. So it looked like Gomez, it, and this is just my two cents, but it looked like Gomez just decided to play ball. It's bad, you know. Well, did it, here's, here's where, here's where uh, McElroy likely is going to go. And this all depends is, depends on whether or not when Cardinal Supic hits 75 on the Feast of St. Joseph this year, if if uh, when he submits his resignation, as he's required to do, if he is going, if Francis is going to accept it or not. Now, my suspicion is that Francis will either not accept it or he will move him to the Roman Curia at that point. Supic has been very, very, very loyal and will probably get rewarded yeah. for it in some way. Yeah, well, that could just be him staying in his current job. But if he does get removed from the Archdiocese of Chicago, McElroy would be the logical person to move over there because he's a cardinal. You can make him a cardinal yeah. archbishop, and then at that point, you still have like a, a cardinal's hat available for somebody. Yeah, but where do you put it? Um, 
So well, I don't know. Like it's, I've found out I this morning, that, there's not a single cardinal in Australia for the first time in like two centuries, which is weird. Wow, that is weird. <laughs> that's bizarre. I mean, but I, that's why I'm speculating. Why is McElroy still in San Diego as a cardinal? Do you think it's to surround Gomez to keep that pressure on Gomez to keep playing ball? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, because otherwise. I mean, you got you got the Archbishop of Los Angeles, the largest diocese in the United States, is not a cardinal, but the guy further south of him in a tiny diocese, San Diego, is a cardinal. Mahoney's still hanging out in Los Angeles. Strickland has to leave the diocese and live elsewhere, um, you know, because uh, he's not allowed to hang out in his hometown where he was born and raised for some odd reason. So it seems hypocritical and weird that. McElroy remains in San Diego, and I wonder what the motive is there. Clearly, they could have moved him somewhere else. I mean, you got DiNardo is getting ready to retire as well. So you're going to have Supich and DiNardo retired, leaving two major dioceses open and available in the United States in uh, in just the next year. So, Assuming that Cardinal Supich's re- res- resignation is accepted by Francis, which probably won't be, right. honestly. DiNardo's has least, already been accepted. <laughs> so he's yeah. just waiting for the day. He's going to be treated the same way that, our, that Hector Aguirre was out in, uh, I think, La Plata, Argentina. Yeah. Like Francis had the letter of acceptance drafted already, <laughs> yes, <laughs> waiting for that exactly. thing. Like, it was yes. that afternoon or something that he got the response <laughs> telling him to pack his yes. bags and go. Yeah, thanks for thanks for coming. Have a great life. God bless. Bye bye. Um, and, uh, yeah. and there's a lot of people here. I mean, my family will be severely affected by it potentially. That are very like on eggshells, um, wanting to know what that next bishop is going to do, especially in regards to Tradicionis Custodis, considering how much Cardinal Donardo hammered the incredible growth of the Latin Mass in this diocese. Uh, that was taking place. I mean, TLMs were popping up in Nova Soto suburban parishes all over the mm. place. And I'll, okay, and there's a there's a lot you could say bad about Donardo, and there's a lot you could say good about Donardo. I've always been the guy in the middle who's who's defended him and criticized him both at the same time in many ways. And one of the things yeah, I will say, you, you could say good about Donardo, and let's just not forget, Donardo came from Pittsburgh with McCarrick being there. So he knows the players. Right. He knows every. He knows where the bones are buried. One hundred percent. There's no questions asked. However, um, forty days for life exists in this diocese because of Donardo. When his chancery did not want it, Donardo made sure it happened. Um, the the well, FSS- anybody who's liberal with the traditional pre- traditional masses at least gets the benefit of the doubt on a lot of things for me because mm. that by yeah. itself being widespread in the diocese is going to pay long term fruit, right. which is exactly why the- traditional custodians have. The FSSP exists in this diocese because DiNardo allowed it to happen, made sure it happened, even when his chancery tried their best to cancel that. He he still got it. Through. Now, he didn't fire anybody in his chancery over that stuff, but he he made sure that it got through. And it exists today because DiNardo uh, has allowed for it. Um, here, but here's another, I think, a long-term implication. The seminary has had huge changes. Is it perfect? No. 100%, there's still issues. But major changes have, have have occurred in the seminary here as a result to DiNardo's tenure. Um, the men, the young men, tend to be far more traditional and orthodox and zealous for the faith uh, now as a result. And many of them want, desire, and have trained in the traditional Latin Mass as a result. In fact, we see seminarians come to our TLM routinely just to come to Mass, just to show up to Mass mm-hmm. on Sunday uh, when and where possible. So I think that, again, I'm not going to say it's perfect. It's not. There's still problems. But it's come a very long way. And we all know that even if they change that tomorrow, it'll still have reverberation, you know, 20 years out. I think the challenge, though, and I've experienced this firsthand being a professional Catholic, is that these young men, they get put on a very strict career path. And that adversely affects them. They're young. They're impressionable. They may be orthodox, traditional even, or what have you. But 20 years in a career with that kind of influence, it'll ruin the best of them. So, oh, I it think will, absolutely. This is, and, they, and also, the seminaries are actively weeding out traditionally minded seminarians. The problem, is, the problem they're running into now is they're starting to get overwhelmed with the number of them like here's yeah. you I, I see i have to go here in a minute but i'll tell you this on a, on the upside i have a somebody that i have spoken to in the past who knows very who knows the jesuits very very well 
mm-hmm. for very good reason. He knows the Jesuits, and he has assured me that the uh, seminary rectors for mm-hmm. the Jesuits are very, very concerned because the number of traditionalists in the yeah. se- in the Jesuit seminaries now Whoa. is a cause for concern for them. Hey now, so there's your there's your there's your white pill for the morning. <laughs> this is good news. I mean, this is like make the Jesuits great again. Rob, are you listening? We need to get Maliki Martin to write a second follow up to the Jesuit book. Ah, oh, darn it. Anyway, God bless Maliki Martin. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, God bless you, Anthony Stein. Look forward to having you back soon. That's going to do it for today's after show. Uh, a couple minutes extra, anyway. Praise be to Jesus. Uh, hopefully, you guys will hang out with us again tomorrow. Make sure to smash that like, subscribe, and share wherever you are, whatever platform you're listening or watching on, or join the Insider Crew on Telegram by going to the Station of the Cross dot com forward slash a c t god bless you god love you we'll see you back here tomorrow morning